Welcome to the Our Voices Resonate Conference, Women and Human Rights in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're so excited to be here today and we want to thank you for being here and for joining us. Y buenos días y bienvenidos a la conferencia Nuestras Voces Resuenan, Mujeres y Derechos Humanos en Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Estamos muy contentas de estar aquí hoy y queremos darles las gracias por su presencia. Uh, we're going to turn over to English now. Ahora comenzamos el programa en inglés. Uh, my name is Laura Rodriguez. I'm a reporter for NBC6, the local station. And as a Cuban-American and someone who is passionate about issues facing women in the region, I am truly honored to be here presenting at this great event, at this conference. It's an honor to be surrounded by so many strong, inspiring women. My name is Cici Portuondo. I'm a very proud representative of the Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba. I'm a passionate supporter of human rights activism and, and women's issues. So as Laura mentioned, it is truly an honor to be here today. And before we get started, it's important we take a moment to thank two organizations that have made today possible. The Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba and FIU's Latin American and Caribbean Center. Their passion and perseverance in making this conference happen has brought us to this moment. We are so grateful for them for their hard work. Let's give them a little round of applause. Um, so the reason we're here at this event, the reason this event was created, is to provide a platform, a point of intersection for these diverse, brave, and fascinating individuals to have a discussion about the various issues facing women in their respective countries. In an attempt to approach these topics from a holistic perspective, we have invited academics, subject matter experts, and civil society leaders at the forefront of the struggle for human rights, women's rights, and democracy to exchange their ideas and give us their insights. Today, we will learn from, encourage, and stand in solidarity with one another as we explore issues ranging from gender violence to education to women in political leadership. We thank our incredible panelists for their participation in this event, and we look forward to getting started. And to get us started, we would like to welcome two very important people to the stage, a Foundation for Human Rights in Cuba Executive Director Pedro Rodriguez, and also the Latin American and Caribbean Center of FIU, um, Frank Mora, the director. Buenos días. Ante todo, permítame extenderle nuestra más cordial bienvenida a esta conferencia. Nuestras voces resuenan. Como director ejecutivo de la Fundación para los Derechos Humanos en Cuba, me resulta un honor inaugurar esta conferencia junto al admirado y querido Frank Mora eh, sobre el rol de la mujer respecto a la lucha por la democracia y los derechos humanos en América Latina y el Caribe que auspicia la Fundación para los Derechos Humanos en Cuba y la Universidad Internacional de la Florida. Los paneles a tratar aparecen en el programa que tienen en sus manos. Aunque en algunas sociedades el rol positivo de la mujer ha aumentado significativamente, lo cierto es que en Latinoamérica y el Caribe, la mujer continúa siendo un blanco favorito de la violencia doméstica, la discriminación laboral, el tráfico humano, la cultura machista y obviamente la represión política. Estamos seguros que la conferencia aportará a todos los asistentes, así como a las panelistas, conclusiones positivas para enfrentar las situaciones que estarán debatiendo en el día de hoy y cómo obtener mejores resultados en nuestras vidas, al igual que en de aquellas mujeres que por su carencia de libertad no tienen las mismas opciones que disfrutamos hoy aquí. En nuestro continente, al igual que en otras culturas y regiones, es costumbre que estos tópicos no sean consultados con la mujer por las, las razones y prejuicios ya mencionados. Pero algo que es invariable es que la mujer representa el 50% de la ecuación humana, que en ocasiones por necesidad u obligación les toca cargar el peso del 100% de esa ecuación. Pero lo que existe, no existe duda, es que muchas veces, más de lo que se le acredita, no dejan de ser el mejor 50% de la ecuación. Para concluir, quisiera citar a José Martí, apóstol de la independencia de Cuba. Las campañas de los pueblos solo son débiles cuando en ellas no se alista el corazón de la mujer. Pero cuando se estremece y ayuda, cuando la mujer tímida y quieta de su natural 
anima y aplaude cuando la mujer culta y virtuosa unge la obra con la miel de su cariño, la obra es invencible. Muchas gracias. Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to, uh, to FIU and, <clears throat> and to this conference. Uh, we have many, many special guests here, and this is going to be an exciting, I think, uh, day of discussion on this important topic that Pedro uh, mentioned. First, before I start, I'd like to uh, sort of recognize uh, FIU President Mark B. Rosenberg, who's here with us. Uh, and and I'll, I'll be brief because I know we're a little uh, behind, but I, I want to do take this opportunity to thank uh, the Foundation for Human Rights, Cuba, Pedro, and your team for allowing us to partner and to host uh, this important conference with uh, all these wonderful uh, people who will be participating and talking about these challenging issues. For us, it's really an honor, and I want to thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. This is a partnership that I hope doesn't end with this event and that will continue into the future, and I look forward to working uh, with you on this project. Uh, and so I hope you enjoy uh, uh, the day. This is uh, uh, certainly going to be a sort of robust discussion day, if you will. So thank you again for all being here, and if you have any questions, please make sure to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Now for the main event, our beautiful women here. Um, we welcome our first panel, um, where we'll be discussing gender violence in the Americas. Our moderator is Yashim Dariji, uh, Associate P Professor in the Department of Physics and Director of Women's Studies here at FIU. Our panelists are Laritza Diversent, Cuban attorney and human rights defender, founder of Cubalex, Madeleine Bastain, Executive Director of an organization dedicated to the social and political empowerment of Haitian women and their families, and Rita Segato, Professor of Anthropology and Bioethics and UNESCO Chair at the University of Brasilia. Take it away, ladies. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you for Frank Mora for such a timely event. When is it not time when it is about human rights and violence against women? It's always time. So in this panel, the title of our panel is Gender Violence in the Americas. And we have three distinguished panelists, which we will be discussing the issue. One of our panelists, I think, as we speak, coming. So I will start introducing Laritza Diversant first. She's a Cuban attorney, independent journalist, and human rights defender. She graduated from University of Havana Law School in 2007, and with several other lawyers, founded the Cuba Legs Legal Information Center. Cuba Legs is dedicated to educating Cubans about their legal rights under the con country's constitution and laws, as well as under international standards. She also co-authors the blog Jury Consulto Cuba, if you would like to follow her. Our second panelist is Marlene Bastian, which I had the pleasure meeting with her in another event. She is the di executive director of FAN, Haitian Woman of Miami, it's an organization dedicated to the social and political empowerment of Haitian women and their families, both in the diaspora and in Haiti. Bastian has more than 20 years of cl clinical experience and eight, eight years of direct administrative experience in 
nonprofit management. She has cha championed the cause of women, children, and Haitian families through her dedicated advocacy in the areas of immigration and human rights, HIV, AIDS, breast cancer, and domestic violence. Thank you for being here. Our third panelist is Rita Laura Segato. She is a professor of anthropology and bioethics and UNESCO chair at the University of Brasilia. She is the director of the Anthropological and Human Rights Committee within Brazil's National Council on Scientific and Technological Research. She has taught at universities in the United States, Canada, France, and Argentina, among others. She published and lectured extensively. A large part of her work is dedicated to the murders of women in places such as Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, El Salvador, and Guatemala. She works constantly to bring these crimes, which she labels feminicide, to the attention of international human rights courts. So I am, with all my heart, I accepted to be the moderator for this panel because at FIU, in Women and Gender Studies, this is our most important initiative right now with SISH behind us 100%. So our relation will continue after this panel and we will form strong bonds. And first I will give the floor to Laritza, please. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Buenos días a todos. Uh, mi nombre es Laritza Diversen. Eh, soy la directora del Centro de, de, Inform Disculpen. El centro de Información Legal Cubalet. Eh, la situación de la violencia de género en Cuba eh, tiene sus particularidades, empezando porque la violencia doméstica en Cuba no está todavía definida en ley. Eh, esto significa que todavía el Estado no ha hecho ningún esfuerzo por eh, centrarse en la violencia de género como un problema social. En escenarios internacionales, y hablamos ante eh, los exámenes que ha presentado el Estado cubano, ante el Comité para la Eliminación de Todas las Formas de Discriminación contra la Mujer, el Estado eh, mantiene la posición de que eh, la violencia doméstica es un problema intrafamiliar, solo en, en el estrecho marco del hogar, y no ha todavía adoptado determinadas medidas para proteger a la mujer cubana contra ese flaquelo. Por ejemplo, en Cuba aún no existen refugios para mujeres víctimas de violencia de género. Todavía no hay medidas de carácter eh, legislativo que las protejan, por ejemplo, como orden de alejamiento o restricción. Tampoco existen medidas cautelares especiales para protegerlas en caso de amenazas contra su vida o integridad personal. Y esto pues, se ha traducido en una falta de concientización y sensibilización en el tema de violencia de género dentro del país a nivel nacional. Aunque en algunos medios se habla del tema, no ha sido de forma generalizada para sensibilizar a la población sobre este tema. Lo que resulta muchas veces es que las mujeres víctimas de violencia de género, cuando uh, en los escasos eh, casos que van a, disculpen la, la redundancia, van a hacer la denuncia ante los órganos de la Policía Nacional Revolucionaria. Eh, como los operadores eh, de la ley o los, que, los funcionarios que están encargados de hacer cumplir la, eh, la ley no están concientizados, pues muchas veces lo que hacen es imponerle una multa al agresor y a la víctima, en este caso, por eh, escándalo público. Entonces, significa que si una mujer víctima de violencia de género va a hacer una denuncia y resulta multada por un escándalo público, pues se van a, re a reducir las posibilidades de que nosotras podamos ir a las autoridades por, una por impunidad. ¿no? Otro punto que está es que 
lo, las autoridades mantienen que entre marido y mujer, por ejemplo, aún no se debe meter los lemas estos patriarcales arcaicos. Y significa que aumente el, 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 el silencio, la invisibilidad sobre la violencia de género en Cuba. Esta situación se agrava para determinados grupos de mujeres, ¿no? como son las mujeres disidentes, que muchas veces son maltratadas en público, como ha sido el caso y han, eh, han corrido por el mundo las imágenes de la violencia eh, contra las damas de blanco. Pero ese no es la, el único tipo de violencia que utiliza eh, el Estado, que nosotros, por ejemplo, en el Centro de, eh, en el centro de Información eh, Cuba le, le llamamos violencia de, eh, institucional, que es la que ejerce el Estado sobre las mujeres, y en este caso, haciendo especial referencia a las mujeres disidentes, a las mujeres que eh, deciden expresarse eh, libremente o, o su opinión política o social, son, eh, ref, eh, utiliza la violencia también de forma psicológica, implica a sus familiares, amenaza con sus hijos. Por ejemplo, eh, lo más reciente en el caso nuestro, que eh, el Centro de Información Legal Cubalet recientemente fue víctima de un robo. Y esta situación ha generado, por ejemplo, que... Eh, ha habido una crisis al interior del equipo. El 60% de, las de, de los miembros de Cubalé son mujeres. Y esto ha afectado en gran medida. Prácticamente las autoridades en este caso eh, dejan en especial situación de vulnerabilidad a, a estas mujeres, aunque decidamos hacer las denuncias. Y, por ejemplo, la amenaza con los hijos, que es una parte de la familia bien importante para, para una mujer, ha sido afectada de manera especial. En el caso también eh, de las mujeres víctimas de, de violencia de género, queremos, eh, hacer, quiero hacer una especial referencia a las mujeres afrodescendientes que eh, por su triple, eh, sufren una triple eh, discriminación dentro de Cuba en razón a su sexo, a su color de piel y a su pobreza, y en la que la violencia institucional es mucho más enmarcada por ejemplo, eh, la violencia eh, en este caso ha sido las mujeres en, en, en el desalojo. Yo, por ejemplo, le traía casos específicos de violencia de género institucional por motivo de desalojo, pero lamentablemente la información fue sustraída antes de venir para acá en esta conferencia y, bueno, y, pues no puedo abusar mucho de la memoria. Solo puedo mencionarle que muchos de estos casos son mujeres pobres madres de dos, tres hijos que se han introducido en inmuebles que son del Estado y la han sacado con auxilio de la policía a la fuerza, incluso muchas de ellas, tratando de proteger a sus hijos, han sido golpeadas por las propias autoridades, incluso lesiones que han puesto en peligro su vida y después de todo este proceso, antes de ser como víctima, han sido acusadas por delitos de desacato, resistencia. Esa es una de las situaciones que eh, genera, se ve con bastante frecuencia dentro del panorama nacional. Otro punto en, en cuanto a la violencia de género dentro de Cuba y que lamentablemente no podemos reflejar con estadísticas porque el Estado no ofrece datos desagregados sobre esta situación a pesar de que los tribunales recogen estas estadísticas, pues es la situación del crimen pasional, que en Cuba, uh, por ejemplo, no se dan ningún tipo de estadísticas en los informes que el Estado presenta y ha sido un llamado de atención por parte del Comité para la Eliminación de Todas las Formas de Discriminación contra la Mujer, que ha recomendado al Estado cubano que inicie estudios, encuestas sobre la violencia eh, en, en, de género para la mujer cubana, pues, como ya le dije antes, el Estado no lo identifica como un problema social, por tanto, no ha emprendido ningún tipo de medida ni de carácter legislativo ni de carácter administrativo para proteger a la mujer. Eh, otro de los puntos en, en el que nosotros hemos, hemos llamado la atención de la violencia de género eh, sobre las mujeres por aquellas que man, eh, tienen una orientación sexual e identidad de género distinta. Las autoridades con estas eh, con las mujeres eh, que tienen eh, su orientación sexual diferente a lo que los estándares eh, en una sociedad machista y homofóbica como la cubana pues tienen manifiestan una posición diferente son triplemente eh, eh, discriminadas y sufren una violencia de género exagerada igualmente nosotros pretendíamos mostrarle imágenes de autoridades como uh, tomadas por la propia policía dentro de Cuba ¿no? en su 
en, en sus cámaras e imágenes, cómo en los espacios públicos uh, no le permiten a estas mujeres desarrollarse y mostrar su, su expresión y su identidad. Y eso es uno de, lo, de los puntos que, eh, que nosotros queremos llamar la atención. Eh, me disculpan por, por un, el, un poco el nerviosismo, pero uh, al final si tienen alguna, alguna duda específica en cuanto a la legislación o los casos que nosotros atendemos en nuestra oficina, uh, pues sin, con gusto estaré dispuesta a responderle. Y eh, un punto especial que tenemos aquí es eh, que el Centro de Cubalet investiga y tuvo la oportunidad de en, en julio de 2013 ir a Naciones Unidas y presentar un informe completo sobre la situación de la... Eh, presentar un informe sobre, sobre la situación de la mujer cubana, en el que incluyó un tema especial, la violencia de género y otros temas, eh, y en el que llamó la atención también como un tema particular preocupante la situación de las mujeres rurales, que eh, generalmente van a la capital a prostituirse por necesidad, aunque el Estado dice que es por lucro, y asociado a este escenario son víctimas de género, eh, porque no tienen un lugar donde vivir, porque la policía las acosa constantemente. Y esa situación, pues nosotros les pusimos en nuestro informe y ha creado, pues por, por supuesto, motivo de descontento para el gobierno y eh, estamos en, en la disposición de eh, responder a sus preguntas y cualquier información adicional que requieran sobre este tema, pues darle más, de, exponer más sobre el tema. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Laritza. Now we will give the floor to Marlene Bastien, and then afterwards we will open the floor for your questions and discussions. First and foremost, I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here this morning. I also would like to thank LAC, uh, Dr. Mora, and also the Human Rights Foundation, the Cuban Human Rights Foundation. I wasn't aware that there was such a foundation, so it was a pleasant surprise for putting this event together and inviting us today. I'm really humbled and happy to be here, and I'm happy to see our colleague uh, Mireille Charles from the Green Family Foundation and all of you here. I have a PowerPoint found, uh, presentation. I was going to start with what we do, what we had to do at FAM to reduce the incidence of violence, but I'm going to start with the second part. So I'm going to ask you to scroll down until you see domestic violence. We're going to start, uh, we're going to give you a framework, the framework that we had to work with uh, in the early 80s when I first arrived here. We're going to show you, we're going to tell you about the incidence of violence in Haiti, and then we have, we'll tell you how and what we had to do in Miami to reduce the incidence of domestic violence and what we're still doing to make sure that the women, women are safe. Keep going down, keep going down. I'm, I'm not going to waste time because I know we only have a few minutes, about 15 minutes, but let me start by saying that when you look at Haiti, there was a lot of um, uh, highlights uh, over the rate of sexual violence, domestic violence in Haiti after the, the 2010 earthquake. But what I can tell you is that domestic violence has always been a big and huge problem in Haiti. I remember when I was growing up uh, in my village, Uh, and some people may be shocked by it, but I can still remember it as a little girl. Uh, in my village, my house was right across the market, and during vacation time, I would go to my village, and I would see uh, the women from down to nightfall working very hard in the village. And then sometimes, as a little girl, I would see the men coming with their big baton, beating them up, either because they were fighting, either because they thought that they were not working hard enough, Uh, either they thought that, you know, there was uh, an order or that they disobeyed because men in Haiti at that time, even now, think that women are their property. Women had the, the, the status of children until Michel Bennett Duvalier, uh, that they have the right to um, discipline women. That's one thing that I remember. I can still see in my mind's eye. The second that I remember growing up in Haiti in the 1950s, I was born in 1959, was that if a man, a young man, loved a young girl, oftentimes what he did, which I thought was grave, he would wait for her while she was all either doing her chores or going to the farm, had sex with her, 
And then the family felt it was normal to organize a, mar- a wedding or find a way to get them together to live together. And even as a little girl, I thought that that was, that was very, very, very harsh. So when I came here in the U.S., I started the organization. I think I'm going to need to do it. Um, it seems like uh, they're having a hard time doing it. I was trying to save time. Anyway, in Haiti today, the rate of violence in Haiti is twice that of the Dominican Republic, twice that of Jamaica, even if crime is lower in Haiti than in these respective nations, in from Jamaica to the Dominican, its neighbors, the Dominican Republic, and other, uh, um, other Caribbean nations. But domestic violence, surprisingly, is higher, two times higher in Haiti than in the Dominican Republic, then in Jamaica, then in other Caribbean nations. So the question you might, you might ask, why is that? Why is a country that is relatively safe and don't believe what you read in the newspaper, Haiti is a very safe country compared to, to its neighbors, why is the, 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 the level of violence so high? This is forward, now it's back. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Okay, all right, you can see the picture. Um, two years ago, we went to Haiti. We oftentimes go there to uh, work on deportation issues, and then we'll mention that briefly during the presentation. And then we visited women, a lot of them victims of violence in the different camps. That was after the earthquake. So violence in Haiti. We're gonna go to the rates because we wasted a, 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 a little time. Haiti struggled with violence even before the trauma and destruction of the 2010 earthquake. Violence against women is used within the family um, as a form of discipline to ascertain male authority. And the state also retaliates against women as a perceived act of subversion. I had uh, about 15 members of my family who were arrested and imprisoned during the Duvalier dictatorship. The women there were victims of violence uh, in the prison. The Sexual Violence Research Initiative shows that the rate of forced sex uh, ever experienced by women in Haiti is 11% is more than twice as high as the rate in the Dominican Republic, which is 5%. The proportion of those experienced sexual violence in Haiti within a 12-month period after the earthquake is almost three times as high, 11% as it is in the Dominican Republic as compared to the Dominican Republic 4%, and almost four times higher than that in Jamaica, which is uh, 3%. Other reports also have noted that sexual violence occurs at a greater frequency in Haiti. The 2000 Demographic Health Surveys deemed sexual violence which accounted for 29% of violence cases reported in Haiti by itself as the most form of violence there. For Haiti, all percentage involving sexual violence add up to 58%, whereas in the Dominican Republic, they amount to 27%. And these stats are not surprising given that Haitian women were found to be more than twice as likely as likely to face sexual violence as women in the Dominican Republic even in two Latin American countries reported in the demographic health surveys, Colombia and Nicaragua, physical violence only was the most common form, occupying 59%. And um, the manner in which men in Haiti um, explain violence, and then they do it even now after years of doing advocacy and education here, Uh, gives you an idea of why sexual violence is so prevalent there. Men, while talking about, uh, like, the sexual act, they all sometimes talk about uh, using violence words, like, uh, uh, I'm going to really beat up a woman. You would think that he would be going to physically attack the woman, but he's actually talking about sex, right? Uh, To club nonstop. Shire, while shire from sa, I'm going to rip her up. That, that's, he's still talking about sex. And then some of you may say, uh, is it really happening even now? But let me give you a quick example. I was, go- I was at the gym last week, 
And then men, a few men, they were talking among themselves and they saw me coming. And one of them said, I'm going damn la, I have a girlfriend, she doesn't want to listen to me. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to beat her, I'm going to put her on her knees, beat her up, and then I will do what we, you just read. So I don't know if he was saying it because he saw me coming, but I'm telling you, this is still a reality here. Uh, men usually use sexual um, uh, violence as a way to subdue or to force women into um, uh, discipline or, or, or to, to get them to do what they're supposed to do. The next most prevalent form of violence in Haiti is physical violence, accounting for 19%. And some might think that it's even higher. I think it's even higher because in Haiti, most, most of the cases of violence are not reported because of fear of reprisal, because the authorities really do not value, uh, do, do not value it when women go to report violence. They make fun of the women when they report violence. And then when the women have to go to, to, to court, and then last year when I was in Haiti, I met with civil human rights organizations. They had to be accompanied with security guards sometimes. And when they get to the court system, the, most of the proceedings are done in French when the women, all of them, 100% speak Creole. So, um, uh, violence, both sexual, physical, are uh, gravely underreported in Haiti. And then why would men batter women? Why would uh, they subject them to violence? Some of the reasons are leaving the house without permission, disobedience, not obeying commands, talking back, sitting, talking your mind, right? Staring. Let's say that your, your husband or boyfriend or common law husband uh, tell you something, and even if you don't, you don't respond, you look at him like that. This is cause. This can be cause for violence. Women are perceived as abusable object, and men generally acknowledge that it was within his right to subject women to violence. The social pressure to fulfill expectations of sexuality, which becomes internalized as an indispensable component of masculine identity, may lead many Haitian men to consider sexual aggression against women as normal. Uh, the young boys, and I know I see some of you are smiling because even here we see that, right? Boys are encouraged to go out there and be young men you know, court women and flirt, whereas the, the girls are taught to be reserved, right? Uh, in our culture, the girls should not be going out at night. When I was growing up in Haiti, I wasn't allowed to go out at night. I was 18 years old. I wasn't allowed to go to a care mess uh, or conference or a movie. But the boys, at a very early age, they are, they are coached, they are encouraged to go out there. As a matter of fact, if they didn't do these things, if they didn't go and court women and, and be tough with women and be a macho, they would they think that they are something there's something wrong with them. They even have a name for them. They call them JJ. That means closely to being retarded. Go figure. All right. So even though I'm not going to read all the international covenants that Haiti signed, and I know many of the countries in the Caribbean and in Latin America do sign them, but guess what? They do not abide by them. They do not respect them. They do not abide by them. Haiti has always been a very open country. Haiti has always been very respectful. For example, Haiti welcome everybody. Hardly ever will you hear that someone is in Haiti and is being... Uh, is a foreigner or a tourist is being attacked. Hardly do you, do you hear that. Uh, Haiti opened its door to the Jews when the US, United States of America was turning them back. Haiti is a very open, uh, very open soci society. So it signs, most, even confidence that the U.S. Is still, hasn't, hasn't, still hasn't signed, the Haiti has signed. But signing them is one thing. Implementing them is the other thing because the, the covenants are signed, but they are not implemented. So even in the Haitian constitution, um, under Haiti's constitution and international law, authorities are required to, ad to address gender-based violence, prohibiting discrimination on the grounds of sex, protecting the right to bodily integrity, and guaranteeing the right to be free from torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, and then, like I said, it signs many convention, but, you know, they don't respect them. And my time is almost over. Okay. A few more minutes. All right. A few more minutes. Thank you. That's good. 
Um, so what do we do and what have we done at FUM and what, what do we do? Like I said, when I first came here, I volunteered at the Haitian Refugee Center and I was shocked that even though the Haitian Refugee Center was an agency providing legal services, women were coming pregnant with black eyes, with marks on their belly, eight months, nine months pregnant. So we decided to do something about it. So we, in our, our almost uh, 25 or the 2000, 2014, 14 years, plus the first nine years that we, we, we worked as a, as a volunteer-led organization, we believe that in order to reduce gender violence in Haiti, in this community and around the world, we need to improve laws and policies. We need to enforce domestic violence laws and permitting non-violence and, and uh, equitable relationships. We need to support national legislation on gender-based violence. That's Haiti, right? That's for Haiti. We need to pressure the state of Haiti to buy by international conventions, not only sign them, but respect them. We need to provide protection of, for women who are victims of domestic violence. We need to sensitize and train judges and police, and this is very needed in Haiti. We do need to do that, and we need to improve services for gender-based violence, which is what we've been doing at FUM, and I'm going to conclude by showing you what we've been doing uh, I'm not going to be, go, be able to go through all the slides here, but I'm telling you that we are a one-stop center. We organize FUM in a way that when someone is a survivor of violence, she can access different services um, uh, in mental health, right? We have an after school for the kids. The, 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 the survivor doesn't have to travel. A lot of them do not have cars anyway. And this is a model that can be replicated to access services. So we have programs for the kids. We also provide immigration services for them and, and uh, advocacy. And we get the women engaged in the advocacy in organizing. They are part of the organizing. They do uh, organize locally. Uh, statewide and nationally, we are getting to, ready to go to Tallahassee. We also travel to Washington in front of the White House. We get them engaged in being their own voice and fighting for themselves for change, for policy change. Where we talk about immigration advocacy, and then you see the women here. They, they, are, they are at the county government, and I'm about to stop. They are at the county government fighting for affordable housing because women who are survivors of violence, one of the main problems that they have is access to housing. All right, and then we, are, we also uh, uh, work with domestic violence within, within a human rights uh, um, uh, framework because we believe that every human being, and I think I'm going to have to stop on that note. I don't have time to continue with the, with the PowerPoint. On that note, I'm going to say this, that at FUM right now, for the past three years, we've um, dealt with, with uh, domestic violence, right, We've engaged our clients because our clients not only receive services, but like I said, they are also partaking in the organizing, empowering themselves, organizing themselves, empowering the community, partaking in our um, uh, weekly radio show, and then also organizing locally and nationally. But we are presenting the domestic violence in the uh, in the human rights framework. And last year we went to Geneva, and this is me here talking in front of the United Nations while they were reviewing the U.S.'s human rights records to show that every human being, every woman, every little girl has a right to live in a society free of fear, free of physical abuse, free of sexual abuse, free of emotional abuse, which leaves scars that last a long time. We just celebrated March 8th, which is International Women's Day. Let's commit ourselves, not only here, and I have, uh, I bought um, uh, flyers for you. Uh, our firm is part of the one billion rising against domestic violence, because we have problems here too. Let's commit ourselves to create a violence-free society for women and girls in Haiti, in the U.S., and around the world. Because when we do that, we create and we craft a better future for us all. Thank you. Now our panelist, Rita Laura Segato. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll speak from here, okay? Sure. Okay. 
Buenos días a todos y voy a hablar en castellano. Eh, es muy importante entender que la violencia eh, de género, eh, especialmente la, mujer, la violencia contra las mujeres y también la violencia homofóbica, se extiende a través de todas las naciones de nuestro continente por igual. Eh, no es posible eh, eh, separar eh, países a este respecto. Eh, es, un, es un mal que nos afecta a todos eh, a, de norte a sur del continente. Eh, quería en primer lugar dar un pequeño panorama de los países que conozco mejor, de los que sé eh, las, conozco la situación, como por ejemplo en México, ¿no? eh, con el momento que vive México en este momento, eh, que se ha transformado en una gran fosa común, con la situación de los migrantes, eh, con el primer lugar que nos llamó la atención, que es Ciudad Juárez, eh, en el primer lugar donde se, el mundo vio eh, un cierto tipo de crueldad ejercido contra el cuerpo de las mujeres, eh, en situaciones que he llamado, sobre todo en mi último texto, eh, las nuevas formas de la guerra y el cuerpo de las mujeres, he eh, comprendido como crímenes contra las mujeres que son crímenes de guerra, o sea, de las nuevas formas de la guerra. Entonces, México es un... Es un gran laboratorio, es un gran espacio nacional donde se, pues, se ha podido percibir eh, muy claramente eh, esta tendencia ¿no? de algo que se inscribe con crueldad en el cuerpo de las mujeres en una situación francamente bélica eh, donde eh, la política ha sido... Eh, eh, contaminada por el narcotráfico y otras formas de producción delictiva del capital, otras formas de acumulación y concentración delictiva del capital. Entonces, a partir de México, donde vemos y donde el mundo hoy conoce por las noticias, ¿no? eh, esta situación de, de guerra informal extendida, ¿no? de pandillas, eh, eh, de maras eh, que han tomado, eh, eh, que, sean, que, que, han, que controlan territorios eh, y la situación de las mujeres migrantes también eh, que eh, con su misión a los coyotes, a aquellas personas que trafican cuerpos, que trafican eh, a los migrantes a través de las fronteras hacia los Estados Unidos, eh, la sexualidad de ahí, la sumisión sexual es una moneda de cambio o más que una moneda de cambio, la forma en que se significa el control jurisdiccional nuevamente de los coyotes y de los traficantes hacia el norte. Entonces, México. Luego los países centroamericanos, Honduras, El Salvador y Guatemala, también con índices de asesinatos de mujeres alarmantes en las dos y de violencia en la situación doméstica y, de, y, no, y violencia también feminicida en una situación que también puede ser definida como bélica si redefinimos la guerra. O sea, si pasamos a entender la guerra de una forma diferente a como la habíamos entendido hasta el presente, como guerra entre estados, como guerra entre naciones. En este nuevo, esta nueva escena bélica que se extiende de México hacia el sur y va, se, expand, se va expandiendo, eh, el cuerpo de las mujeres eh, asume una posición y un lugar central en la expresión de esa situación bélica. Voy a referirme a eso eh, de aquí a un minuto después de hacer este panorama general. Entonces, México y esos tres países Um, tienen esa característica. En ellos se ve más claramente la expansión de la escena bélica con este nuevo formato. Eh, en el caso de Guatemala, la herencia, especialmente en Guatemala, ¿no? la herencia eh, del, de lo que es llamado ahí como el conflicto interno, ¿no? eh, la, el papel eh, que tuvo el cuerpo de las mujeres en la expresión de la dominación por parte del ejército eh, eh, del ejército y en sus acciones francamente paramilitares eh, de exterminio de los pueblos indígenas y cómo el terror eh, ejercido sobre el cuerpo de las mujeres fue central justamente 
para eh, significar el dominio de, eh, sobre estas poblaciones. ¿no? Eh, eh, tengo la experiencia durante todo el año pasado de haber preparado una de las pericias, uno de los peritajes ¿no? que para la nueva, el nuevo tribunal que se va a constituir eh, como uno de los tribunales de mayor riesgo, que así son llamados en Guatemala, el segundo que va a ser constituido y que va a juzgar por primera vez por parte de un Estado nacional eh, en crímenes específicos de guerra contra las mujeres durante el conflicto interno con la eh, prostitución forzada, eh, eh, la esclavitud sexual forzada de un grupo de mujeres mayas quechíes de la aldea de Sepur Sarco. Entonces, es claro ahí cómo esa reducción de las mujeres a prostitución por parte de un Estado que se transforma en un paraestado ha sido una de las características de esa, de, de esa guerra. ¿no? El uso de esos cuerpos y la crueldad ejercida sobre esos cuerpos como una forma de significar el poder Militar. Power, military power. Eh, por eso, eso todo nos, nos convoca a, a colocar eh, la sexualidad y la agresión sexual en el centro de nuestras consideraciones, inclusive cuando estamos estudiando el Estado o los Estados, todos los tipos de Estados. Eh, la situación en Nicaragua, donde estuve el mes pasado, ¿no? con un, nuevamente un Estado que persigue al movimiento feminista por razones que son de su alcoba, ¿no? de su historia personal. Personal, de la historia personal de los gobernantes con la terrible situación de Soy la América eh, entenada, o sea, hija adoptiva del presidente Ortega con su carta extraordinaria publicada de 10 páginas, publicada en 1998 sobre los abusos que sufrió de su padre, hoy presidente de la nación, y el abandono por parte de su madre. La carta de Soy la América es conmovedora, yo creo que debe ser leída, aunque es difícil difícil leerla por todos nosotros. Entonces, ¿cuál es la política del Estado nicaragüense hoy? Es una política que coloca en el centro la familia, el discurso de la familia como forma de reducir la queja de las mujeres. Una buena mujer es aquella que no se queja para no atentar, para no desconstituir la familia de la que forma parte. El discurso del Estado nicaragüense hoy es ese. Primero la familia, después el sufrimiento de las mujeres. Pasamos a la situación de Colombia, donde en mi lectura la situación más convocante y interesante es la formación de varios grupos de investigación que han denunciado que el Instituto Médico Legal, no por, digamos, necesariamente por una... Un, una, mala, una mala voluntad, eh, eh, pero sino por el desvío que tiene la óptica del Estado siempre, en sus, eh, en sus formularios, en sus protocolos de investigación de las fosas comunes que se encuentran como consecuencia de la guerra interna de ese país, de, de poblaciones que se han encontrado eh, aprisionadas en el combate entre las FARC y los paramilitares, eh, en esas fosas comunes comunes se encuentran eh, los cuerpos de una cantidad de, de, de muertos eh, en estos embates y allí se ven de la misma forma los cuerpos, los, los restos de hombres y de mujeres. Entonces, un nuevo eh, grupo de investigadores, primero en Colombia, pero que luego ha sido seguido más recientemente en Argentina, dicen es necesario ver en esas fosas comunes lo que ha sido específico de la crueldad contra el cuerpo de las mujeres porque el cuerpo padrón es el cuerpo masculino. Entonces, eso también en Argentina emerge hoy como una, un frente feminista, un frente femenino en las investigaciones sobre lo que pasó, lo sucedido durante la dictadura militar eh, y la conciencia creciente de lo que sufrieron las mujeres y lo, sufrió, lo que sufrieron los hombres ha sido diferente. Eh, y que es necesario también indagar el sufrimiento específico de las mujeres en los calabozos de la dictadura, así como las fosas comunes en Colombia. Entonces, en estos dos países tenemos grupos de investigación, sobre todo constituido por mujeres, pero no exclusivamente, que 
women, but que predican o que tratan de que los, los protocolos de investigación forenses tengan especificidades o sean capaces de acoger la diversidad de lo que ha ocurrido con las mujeres y los hombres en esas fosas comunes eh, que se están desenterrando eh, constantemente en nuestro país. En el Ecuador, una figura, un, un, un elemento que llama la atención en el momento presente okay. es eh, las restricciones a la sexualidad femenina, juvenil, con algunos eh, discursos del, presiden del presidente y algunas eh, eh, iniciativas políticas que tratan de, eh, a partir de una perspectiva católica, eh, conservadora, eh, decir que eh, las mujeres deben jóvenes deben restringir su, su sexualidad y también una política que pone en el centro la familia en detrimento de las mujeres. En el Brasil, lo que llama la atención, solo para hacer un panorama general del continente, eh, y ver cómo eh, el destino de las mujeres atraviesa fronteras nacionales y tipos de gobierno eh, y tendencias de los gobernantes y constituye una escena común. O sea, que eh, trasciende las diferencias entre estados. Eh, en Brasil, con una mujer asesinada cada hora y media en las últimas estadísticas, ¿no? hace dos años, la estadística era que una mujer era asesinada cada dos horas, pero en la última, última estadística de violencia, eh, lo que arroja es que una mujer es asesinada cada hora y media. Eh, en este país lo más mapeado ma es la violencia doméstica, pero um, hay como una dificultad de vocabulario para expresar otras formas de morir de las mujeres en un espacio bélico en la nación que tiene las tres ciudades más, de las cinco ciudades más violentas del mundo, tres son brasileñas. Eh, la, la ciudad más violenta del mundo, como ustedes quizás sepan, se encuentra en Honduras, San Pedro Sur. En Brasil, sin embargo, todavía no hay un buen mapa, una buena comprensión de las mujeres que, que mueren en la situación bélica ¿no? del crimen organizado. Y lo más conocido es la escena de la violencia doméstica. Bolivia, ¿no? que es un país que llama muchísimo la atención porque es un país pacífico en lo que, en lo que dice respecto a la cantidad de homicidios, cada 100.000 homicidios, pero con un dato que nos llama poderosamente la atención. En un país cuyas estructuras eh, de Estado están en franca democratización en lo que respecta a las cuotas para mujeres en la política, o sea, mujeres legisladoras, mujeres en los ministerios, mujeres indígenas, legisladoras y en los ministerios, y tenemos una situación rarísima, porque si la media mundial de homicidios de mujeres dentro de la totalidad de los homicidios en el mundo, la media, es de 17%, en, Brasil tenemos, en, Bra en Bolivia tenemos una, una situación pe peculiar. De todos los homicidios perpetrados, aproximadamente el 60% son homicidios de mujeres. Un número que nos sorprende en un país um, con estructuras en franco proceso de democratización. Argentina es un país mío, asolado por la trata. O sea, la cantidad de desapariciones de mujeres y de mujeres encontradas con trazos de violación cruenta, seguidos de, seguida de muerte, pero especialmente la situación de la trata de mujeres en el país y del, 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 del contrabando de mujeres para, eh, por motivos de para fines de trata, es uh, lo que llama poderosamente la, la atención. Entonces, en este panorama continental en el que he hablado sobre algunos países y sus puntos más específicos y llamativos, solo como para ofrecer eh, rápidamente ese panorama, tenemos en el movimiento feminista tres polémicas, solamente las voy a mencionar brevemente, para dar una estructura a eh, lo que acabo de relatar. Eh, una polémica sobre 
de, si debemos tipificar de forma diferenciada case, los, los eh, feminicidios que son domésticos, o sea, que ocurren uh, en, 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 en el seno de relaciones ones, interpersonales y afectivas, y feminicidios que son bélicos. Para eso se hace necesario identificar, definir y crear formas de representación que todavía no están todavía circulando de esto que vengo llamando de las nuevas formas de la guerra o esa guerra informal que tiene que ver con la, produc con la, con la producción mafiosa de capital eh, en nuestros países. Entonces, es, es mi posición que debemos claramente perseguir esos dos tipos de asesinatos de mujeres de forma diferenciada. Good morning, Nora Gámez from New Herald. My question is for Laritza. Do you see in the Cuban case in particular, do you see any type specific violence against women, the opposition women, the women in the op opposition uh, areas of the country? That is there violence in Cuba at the present time against them? Do you see a particular element that has to do specifically with that, with the violence against women? In the case of um, Damas de Blanco, your case, That's one of the main topics that uh, in the past four years that have been working at the center, we have detected. We have detected specific violence against uh, dissident women or uh, uh, part of the opposition, uh, different definitions that you can give individually for people who don't agree with the government. You know, the, the random de detention, you know, they are apprehended. Randomly, in a violent way, we have had uh, uh, during the detention process, uh, the apprehension process, there have been sexual references during the, uh, the process, the uh, search, the body uh, search, uh, uh, they, they have to remove all the clothes, uh, and they don't want to do that, they force uh, them to do so, so they also search in their genitalia, looking for recording devices or phones, you know, that uh, uh, taken care of by the officer no? that have been uh, also victims of violence. You know, that's on behalf uh, of the authorities. La, el, la, um, usually, they place them in particular uh, cells no where they don't have any privacy. Para una, para They're required for a woman, you know, like for your toilet, your bathroom, if they, they all see la, them la uh, when they go to the bathroom. So we have been able to detect that in different interviews that we have had with people with a lot of dissident women last year. New Year's Eve, December 31st, we interviewed most of all of, of the people uh, that were arrested Bruguera, due to the Tanya Bruguera performance, and we reiterated a lot of the actions that we had described in the, the report that we presented in the ASHE on regards to the Damas de Blanco. So that is something that they do usually to use that type of technique with the dissident uh, women. So there's also psychological uh, violence on regards to to the family members. Sorry. Psychological violence against the family. They use, they threat their children. They threaten their children, so they don't, as a punishment sometimes for what they do or they say. So that is another practice that the authorities uh, have for dissident women. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Go to the microphone. 
Good morning. Good morning. You were saying uh, you were the one that gave us the first idea. You had two more ideas. Uh, could you please share those two ideas with us and conclude for a second? Very brief. So I, that's, that was very interesting. So I want for you to do that. Oh, thank you so much for, for, for that opportunity. Yes, the first one was uh, the importance of uh, separate at least to prepare the protocols for research. All the of uh, domestic violence to compare with the warlike uh, violence. You know, second of all, is like a discussion in, in for feminism in Latin America that is si growing is that if the the American, American war uh, is being created at home, or maybe the, the war in the case of Guatemala, that's a lab for me to do that, or maybe the war or the, the uh, war techniques uh, or the strategy, the war strategy that they use women body in a certain way, that's what it makes it make this worse at home, you know, that's the violence. That my, that's my point of view, you know, the, the war manuals have, teach, have trained soldiers to be able to, to, to don't care about women's bodies or children's bodies, you know, so the whole ambience that is generated uh, because of war, the indigenous uh, households are more violent than before. And the third is that Es la situación de las mujeres situation in regards o sea, to the indigenous women situation. Is. We cannot think about their situation a partir de uh, if we have a feminism general, perspective general, in general, or worldwide, or maybe eh, we have to address that separately. Specific, we should think la, la very specifically de la that this exacerbation of, de of violence within that village. You know, I worked 10 years with the indigenous world in Brazil. Maybe the increase in violence in the the indigenous world it has to be understood uh, through a particular, very specific process by, guided by the village uh, philosophy. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, good morning. Is uh, possible for all of one? Uh, we have heard um, that... Uh, we have heard that in every single country, the the respect for human rights has been weakened. So the Center of Democracy of Venezuela. My question is, if we try to reinforce women's image, or we have tried to do that, to be able to sustain or strengthen democracy. There are certain international agreements that what kind of strength have you received on behalf of the United Nations to be able to to have uh, or try to improve that reality? Are there programs at the present time? There are programs that can affect that or can benefit this, so all the countries that are going through this problem can be account accountable and they could be responsible for the people who are in charge of the politics in their countries can be accountable. Who would like to answer? Any yeah. comments? Yes? Sí. Yeah. Yes, so of course, what we need to understand is why with the increase of legislation and we have more law and public policies and different institutions, why cruelty is increasing on women's body? Why don't we see a, 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 a decrease in the problem of uh, gender violence? You know, that's a huge question. But we also see that there are laws that have problems with the Brazilian law, Maria da Peña, domestic violence is a law that is just for domestic violence. The law in Mexico, where I participated recently in the Tribunal Penal of the Popular International, the PPP in the Mexican chapter, I was a judge in Chihuahua. So we can't criminalize crimes that are Porque se entiende que todos los crímenes con la contra las mujeres son crímenes de la intimidad, son privatizados, hay fuerzas permanentes que privatizan todo lo que le sucede a 
behind that Entonces, too. Esa privatización permanente, so encierro permanente that, en, el, that en el fuero de la intimidad de todo lo que sucede a las mujeres hace con que sea muy area. difícil so encuadrarlos en la ley o tratarlos debidamente en el campo uh, del Estado. Uh, state, uh, We have okay. Quickly, quickly, I'd like to say something quickly. So the United Nations is present and active with uh, women's rights organizations in different countries and in Haiti, for example. But we know that this is not a solution. The solution is make, making sure that we establish rule of laws in these nations so that women's rights are respected, that women are considered like human beings deserving of rights and being born with inalienable, inalienable rights. So if the rule of laws uh, does not exist in these countries, no matter what the UN, UN does, because they are very active in Haiti, nothing will change. So we need to make sure that the rule of law is established, that we change this culture of, of believing that women is less than men, less than a human being, that human, women are, are, are human beings with rights that need to be protected. And until we do that in these different nations, the problem will continue. And then we need to work with both men and women because changing the world uh, to, be, to, to become a safer world for women is the job of both men and women because there cannot be no peace without the full emancipation and the full protection of women worldwide. Thank you very much for the great discussion. I invite our panelists from panel one off the stage, and now we're going to begin panel two. Uh, panel two will explore women and civil society in Cuba. Our moderator is Jorge Duani. He's the director of the Cuban Research Institute and a professor of anthropology here at FIU. Our panelists are Berta Soler, Yusmila Reina Ferrera, and Miriam Kornblith. <laughs> 